it's gone well so far for Mike McDonald. The Seahawks were 3-0. and They were one of the last three remaining unbeaten teams going into last night. Let's have a listen to what McDonald had to say after the game following the first loss of his head coaching career. Not a good enough performance on our front. Got to give uh, Detroit a lot of credit. Um, I thought they had a great plan offensively. Um, definitely, I mean, they, they borderline, they just outplayed us on uh, the defensive side of the ball for us. Um, I will tell you this, our guys fought the heck out of that game. They went down to the last second. And um, that's what I'm most proud of right now. And we're going to hold on to that. And that's, that's a foundation that we've built here that we're going to you know, push forward with. And uh, you know, we're four weeks into the season. And look, I mean, the message all week has been you know, that we're on the foundation of, of our football team and where we want to be. And it's obvious you know, we're not the team that we want to be yet. And um, we shouldn't be the team that we're going to be. You know, we have, we have time to grow as a football team. We have a short week. We have to have a sense of urgency about it. And we need to take the next step. I mean, he's absolutely right. Teams change. They get better or they get worse. They very rarely are static from week one through week 17. And I wasn't a big believer in their 3-0 and record because of the quality of the opposition. It wasn't that long ago that McDonald was dismayed over surrendering 185 rushing yards to the Patriots in a game that they had to take to overtime to win. Now, the Broncos had not looked good offensively and still haven't looked great offensively. They won a game by scoring only 10 points on Sunday. And uh, I can't remember who the Seahawks beat week three, but it didn't make me say, wow, this is a team that's ready to go on a run. So, so yeah, I last night's game, I learned more about the Seahawks than I had in the first three combined, and I see a team that can be competitive, a team that can contend, a team that can maybe even take that division given the injury issues that the 49ers are currently dealing with. Oh, there's there's no question. I, um, you look at their talent, it's not like – it's not like Pete Carroll left them with with uh, meager talent. They have pretty good talent. They beat the Dolphins, by the way. Yeah. So they beat the Dolphins with Skylar Thompson and Tim Boyle. So I can understand why you wouldn't be. I'm already all, all erasing. That I'm Mike, already erasing. I'm already. I've already gotten the neuralizer on the Dolphins' 2024 20, season, as all Dolphins fans would like to get. They want to see Will Smith. Two weeks ago, it was Eagles fans that wanted the neuralizer. From Will Smith from Men in Black now now and that's again that was Devin on the variety pack day that we talked about the neuralizer but now Dolphins fans ready for the neuralizer I have already apparently been visited by by Mr. Smith and I had my memory wiped clean of that game and you should <laughs> you should <laughs> after that that was a miserable game even even Seattle doesn't count that one as an impressive win but I think you said they could win the division. I agree with you. Look, offensively, we talked about these quarterbacks who are having their moment. The moment for Geno Smith continues. I know he had the big year in, in 22, but Geno Smith's a really good quarterback. He made some great plays last night. He's got a good arm. He understands that offense. And you look at those, uh, look at those receivers. Uh, you know, DK Metcalf, they had a real problem just – Staying with him last night, he made some acrobatic catches and just the power of Metcalf. Metcalf, Smith and Jigba, you know, Kenneth Walker. I mean, they got a lot of, they got a lot of range to their offense too. I think what's surprising to Mike McDonald, and I think he's going to figure it out even more after this game, is that the defense needs a lot of help. Uh, I just don't think, uh, I, I, I don't think he has really gotten the gravity of where he is compared to where he was. And maybe that's why you underestimated the Lions. Because you remember last year, the Lions went to Baltimore where Mike McDonald was, and they decimated the Lions. It was, no, it was no contest. That was not even a competitive game. They overwhelmed them defensively. And maybe he thought, hey, we did this. This was, this was last year. I coordinated a defense last year. I shut these guys down. Maybe it's a little more of the same. Well, you're far away from Baltimore, Mike. I think they got some work to do on, on the defensive end against quality competition. This is their first and quality offense they faced all year. Geno Smith was the first guy in recent years who had that washout of an experience with the team that drafted him. 
extended stretch as a backup, going here, there, and everywhere before earning, in competition with Drew Locke, the opportunity to be the starter in Seattle after the Russell Wilson trade. He's in year three now. It wasn't a fluke. He's in year three, and last night he set career highs and completions attempts, and I also believe yardage. They were talking about that late in the game. I haven't gone back and checked it, but I, but I assume I assume that the ESPN researchers fed the proper information to Joe Buck as he was relaying that to the rest of us. But when you look at this, Geno Smith, Sam Darnold, Baker Mayfield, Justin Fields to a certain extent. You could even put Jared Goff in there because he was thrown overboard by his original team. Even though he didn't fail, he made it to a Super Bowl. He washed out with his original stop. We know how the NFL is. Copycat, copycat, copycat. So, so what I suspect will be happening in these organizations this year, and you'll have owners who push general managers and coaches, find me the next one. Who's out there that we've overlooked? Because there's this idea, and maybe it's just hard to sell to the fans. Hey, Here's who our quarterback's going to be. I remember when they started leaking the idea that Sam Darnold was plan B to Kirk Cousins. And I remember the feeling in the pit of my stomach about the the prospect of Sam Darnold (laughs) being the starting quarterback for the Vikings. Because we view a guy a certain way. You get that reputation, and it's hard to wash it off. And even as you you wash it off and you're still, oh, that's just Sam Darnold. He, He stinks. And... And I think that the challenge for teams is to forget about that, find the next one. Where is the next one lurking? Is it Zach Wilson? I don't know. Where is the next guy who was stigmatized by bad circumstances who can rise and be a better quarterback? And as investment goes, whether it's signing a veteran, trading for a veteran, using that high draft pick currency on an unproven rookie, it's a hell of a deal if you can find a guy like that. So as we try to figure out where the trend lines are going to be in the NFL, I, I think it's it's ludicrous for teams to not be studying every failed former starter out there and say, is this more is this guy another example of this long line that we're we're assembling? of failed quarterbacks who have found their way. I think you're right. I think it will happen for two kinds of teams. You know, one, the kind of team that say where the Broncos were last year, I think they wound up with the 12th pick, right, with with Bo Nix. So teams in that range, you know, 12, 13 to 17, they have that draft position They're not that good. They don't have a quarterback, and they miss out on the top four, top five. Let's say it's four great franchise quarterbacks, and you're picking 13 or 14, and you don't have the capital, or you just can't find a partner. You can't move up. So these owners are saying, well, okay, you could move up to find the next kid, the franchise kid, but I've seen these other teams kind of rehab and repurpose some of these quarterbacks Go out and find me one of those. And then the other kind of team is one where you feel like you've got uh, some high-priced talent around the roster. You don't really love your quarterback situation. So you go and find one of these guys to make it work. Our roster is great. We're just missing the right kind of quarterback. So find me a quarterback that will unlock this roster, and you can't find them in the draft. So go ahead and, and give me one of these guys. Yeah, and we're not settling. We're not settling. We're, you know, I say that the guys who enter the NFL via the draft are basically lottery tickets, and nobody knows until you scratch off the ticket whether or not the the ticket is going to cash. And there's so many factors that go into it beyond the ticket. It's the coaching. It's the supporting staff. It's the the ownership. It's it, but 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 it all gets stuck on win or lose. It's stuck on the player. But you know, to continue that a step farther. There's still one box left to scratch for some of these guys. They give up on the ticket before they really know whether or not there's a winner there. And and I think the key is shedding the stigma, getting the fans to still buy tickets, show up for games, get excited when you're getting Zach Wilson. I mean, think about how hard it would be to sell Zach Wilson to a fan base. But what's the difference between Zach Wilson 
Sam Darnold, Geno Smith. You know what the similarity is? The Jets ruined all three of them to start their careers. Hell, let's go find Christian Hackenberg, Michael. Maybe he's got some <laughs> right. gas in the tank. <laughs> right. Yeah, let's, let's start going down the list, okay? Who do we forget about? I wonder, though, is, is Zach Wilson, is he the guy? So would he be one of those guys, if you're a fan of a team, and, and Zach Wilson, if you look at this whole rebirth of the uh, washed-up bus quarterback, we thought he was a bus, but not quite. There's more to the story. Would you buy it? If you, let's say if you got what your team has. Like the, the Vikings have an elite play caller in Kevin O'Connell. So let's say Kevin O'Connell... That type, O'Connell, a Ben Johnson, a Sean McVay, like a really respected, and now after last night, throw Ryan Grubb in the list too uh, from the Seahawks. You got a really respected play caller, and you got a guy who's never had one because those guys never really had one. Would you buy it if, you, if it's your, your team? And they say, hey, we got, we got the infrastructure to support a Zach Wilson. The guy's the number two pick in the draft. He's got a big arm. He's got all the traits. We can do this. He can actually thrive in our system. Well, the PR staffs out there for any team that is thinking about doing it now have more ammunition than ever before to put lipstick on the pig if it goes that way. Because they can say to the columnists, the beat writers, the TV talking heads that are out there that they try to, to spin a certain way. It's not as tough of a spin as it used to be because you can start rattling off all the names of all the quarterbacks who have turned it around. And here's why we think we found. We scoured film. We went back to college. We went all the way back to high school. We think this is the guy. Bear with us. Give us a chance. This could be the next guy. And at some point, you appeal to the egos of the people who craft the opinions who just don't want to be wrong, and they think, hey, maybe, maybe they do have. Maybe Zach Wilson is the guy. Who knows? But that's part of the shift in the mindset that everybody's going to have to accept as teams become more deliberate in taking guys that we've all written off and say, wait a minute, have we learned nothing from 2024 and for Geno Smith, 2022 and 2023? So it's, it's, a, it's a neat thing to watch going forward. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.